All right, Galatians chapter 1 is where we are. I hope you have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there are some Bibles available uh, over here by the stairs. There's usually five or ten available for us. Wednesday nights, we do a little bit more of a Bible study kind of format. We have started the book of Galatians, and uh, this is the third message of this series. There's six chapters in this book. Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday night, we, uh, Jason, you didn't see that, did you? <laughs> no, not at all. Let's see if they'll fall off of this chair. Wednesday night, we usually, it's when we have missionaries that come in and uh, different guest speakers. We have a couple that are coming up in, in January that'll, that'll be a, a young woman from Zambia will be presenting her field. Uh, I don't personally know her, but uh, I've been told she has been greatly used by the Lord, so I'm very excited for her to be coming as well. We have a couple other people, family heading to Spain, will be with us soon as well. Love Wednesday nights, a little bit more family-oriented, a uh, smaller crowd, able to dig into the Scriptures a little bit. Let's pray, and we'll start in verse 11. Father, thank You for Your words. Thank You for divine illumination, and Your Spirit would speak into our hearts. God, we don't want to be a people uh, that just fall into the routine of church. God, we want to be a people that have an intersection with You, that we, are, that we meet You and hear Your voice and are changed, whether it's dramatically or, or minutely. God, we really do need You to transform us and, 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 and make us more like You, to conform us to Your image. Now, there, there's just some things we cannot manufacture, and that's it, God. So please do the work that only you can do. Work through thy spirit in our lives, for we open up your word this evening and ask for your will to be accomplished. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Galatians chapter 1 in verse 11, he says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in the times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers." But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, verse 17, that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days." But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. I've entitled this section of Scripture, uh, Paul's Religion, if you will, okay? Everyone starts off with some religious beliefs. We are born, all of us, into some kind of religious system, whether we are Bath Baptist or Catholics or Muslim or agnostic. We all have a system in which we have been raised, and many of us, we will modify that system tweak that system to our own personal tastes and preferences. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, Muslims get flack for being radicals and, you know, uh, being extremists. Well, I lived next to a, a few Muslims that could care less uh, about going to a mosque or praying five times a day or the things that we see. Uh, just like many Catholics and just like many Baptists, that modify their life to still be Muslim, to still be Catholic, to still be Baptist, uh, but be in a system that really doesn't change who they are. We all choose what we want to believe and what we don't want to believe. Paul was a very zealous man. He was a Pharisee. Uh, and he was a part of the Pharisaical system. The Pharisaical system was a very tight, rigid, 
It was very an inflexible system, especially when it comes to Jesus, okay? So Paul was a man that was fixated on removing the scourge of Christianity, the seeds of the gospel that had been planted. He was wanting to get rid of all of this before it did any more damage. I want you to go to Acts chapter 7. We're going to do a little flipping tonight. You okay with flipping? Hallelujah. Acts chapter 7. This is the story of Stephen, um, and there's a transition that's going to take place. I just want you to see it here. It says in Acts chapter 7, verse 55, you find it? But he, okay, one, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, this is Stephen, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul. Okay, this is, this is the Paul that we're talking about in Galatians. This is the Saul. These are the same people, okay? So where was Saul before he became Paul? He was hanging out watching Stephen, this man that was filled with the Holy Ghost, get stoned. Now, I know that we don't do stonings anymore, but it is a violent and grotesque uh, 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 execution, if you will. You literally are pounding people with stones. You are throwing large rocks and boulders. We're not talking about little gravel pieces that are going to prick them and hurt them. We're talking about, you know, uh, many pounds being thrust at them. And it finally, when it hits their head, it crushes their skull and their brains ooze out. This is what Saul is watching happening, and this is what he is agreeing with. So he says back to Galatians chapter 1, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel that was preached of me is not after men, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught of it, okay? He is going to defend himself from the attacks that are coming uh, about his credentials. There are those that wanted to discredit Paul because he was not from the right school. He was not from the right church mission agency. He was not credentialed appropriately by man. He was not approved by the other apostles. If you do a search on Paul the Apostle on Google, and you'll find many articles that, that are written by different theological views that would suggest that Paul doesn't belong, his writings do not belong in the Scripture, that he is antagonistic towards the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? So here he is on the scene here, and maybe you're here today and you thought, oh, I've never heard that before. There are always those that are going to attack the Scriptures. There are always those that are going to uh, attack the authenticity of what God is trying to do here. The gospel is the good news, and just because a man has not gone through the proper school just because a man has not uh, uh, been approved by the right people does not mean that there is a uh, copyright, if you will, on this. God is the gospel, is the good news. There is no copyright on that. There is no way that we can hold that back. A man is allowed to take that, and he's allowed to go forth with that. It does not matter what your denomination uh, or your church board or your bishops or your elders or your members say. God is the gospel. Now we look in verse 12. He says, I, I, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Now this is very interesting here. Normally, the gospel is communicated by man. I want you to go to Acts chapter 9 now. We're going to do a little bit of reading. Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. 9 comes after 8. 9 verse 1, okay? So this is going to be, this is going to be Paul's conversion story right here. And if you've never read this before, you're going to see what takes place. Now, this is a violent man. This is a man that, that is against. He is an enemy of Jesus. 
He is an enemy of the people that would call themselves disciples of Jesus. Verse 1, you with me? Thanks, Dan. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Okay, so we see in verse 1, he's threatening, uh, he's talking about slaughter here in verse 2. And he desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he may uh, find any on this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So in verse 2 he says, I, I, need, I need these priests to give me letters that allows me, that gives me permission, and, and you see in your Bible it says that are any of this way, okay, the way of Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Any that are of that way, I want to be able to uh, slaughter them. Verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Interesting. Who is he persecuting? He's persecuting the church, right? He's persecuting the people of God. He's persecuting the followers of Jesus. But when the Lord confronts him, he says, why are you persecuting me? Boy, that's interesting. Verse 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling, he was just confronted by Jesus, and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat or drink. Verse 10, there came a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Verse 13, then Ananias answered, Lord, um, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. Here's his reputation right here. You see that? They knew who this guy was, and he called him evil. Verse 14, and here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on your name, on, your, on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him that said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately... There fell from heaven, uh, there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized, okay? So we see in this text, Paul's salvation is taking place. We see at this point in verse 19 and verse 20, he straightway gets up. He's going to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 21, all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name, the name of Jesus in Jerusalem? Verse 22, but Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Jerusalem, proving that this is the very Christ. The revelation that Saul needed was the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, I love this story because God was willing to intersect in his life. He met him on this road, and he revealed himself. Now, this doesn't happen with us today. We're not going to get revelation from an angel. That's actually what Galatians 1 says. If an angel shows up and, and begins to, it's, we don't need that. And, and, and dreams and visions, we don't need that. Actually, what the Bible says is we have a more sure word of prophecy, meaning that we are able to open up the Scripture and we are able to study and read and contemplate and realize that what we have is greater than any of those revelations. But 
Honestly, most of us dream it would be really cool if I was walking down or driving down 390 or 490 or on the canal path, and all of a sudden, right? Kevin, Kevin. <laughs> I mean, we kind of think that would be cool. But what God has given to us is the way to actually have that same revelation that met Saul on the road to Damascus, we can have that same revelation take place in our own hearts. That's why we do this right here. That's why we do Word 365. That's why we do discipleship. That's why we do life groups. That's why we try to connect. That's why we have church services, because we believe as the Word of God is spoken that God's voice is heard. It almost seems too simple, doesn't it? I'd rather be walking down the road and, and have this thundering voice speak to me. And, you know, this is so anticlimactic to open up my Bible. We've become so accustomed to this. But this is a privilege for us to open up God's divine word and to receive nourishment. Paul likely had heard about this Jesus of Nazareth. He obviously had rejected the witness of his disciples and, and, as blasphemy, and he was working hard to exterminate Christianity. See, we all have our own religion before coming to Christ. We all believe our path is the correct path. Paul thought the way of the Pharisee, the way of the law, the way of Moses, the way of violence, the way of extermination was the path of God, only to find out that he was completely wrong. This is the hard part of religion, because religion creates for us oftentimes systems, and those systems usually don't do very well with Jesus and the, and the, and the, and the genuineness of the actual Scripture. Paul was a a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a bright man. He was a, probably a genius, some would say. And here he was completely misplaced in his understanding of God's will. We all think we're going down the correct path at some point. Then there is a confrontation that happens, and I believe this happens in every person's life. And I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about reading a track. I'm not talking about a song that touches our heart. I'm talking about the Spirit of God that is a light to all men in this world. That at some point, God confronts every one of us. For the heavens themselves declare the glory of God. And we will be held before Him without excuse. I've spent a lot of time over the years trying to talk people into Christianity only to realize I have no ability whatsoever to convince people. I've read books uh, on, 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 uh, called Tactics, right? I've read multiple books on, on how to help people learn and understand and, and how to get people and what's the right prayer and what's the right thing I should say and all of these things. And I've realized uh, over the years there is no right phrase there is no uh, puzzle that you just have to put together and the person is going to receive the gospel and everything is going to be transformed. The, the one piece to the equation that I cannot supply is the divine piece. It's the Holy Spirit. He's the one that has to be present. Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, has to come and do His work or my efforts are useless. But God does use men. The beauty of Christianity is it, it does not teach that we can reach up to heaven. It teaches that God has come down to earth, doesn't it? God has entered human history and the human heart, that death and burial and resurrection. God manifested. We just talked about this, right, that we don't have our manger anymore, but we used to have a manger here. This is Jesus manifest so that he could take away the sin of the world. This wasn't him sitting up in the heavens saying, hey, hey, come on up here. If you can get up here, everything will be fine. No, he said, let me come down there. Let me come down there and help you because you are in need. Verse 13 of, of Galatians chapter 1, he says, For ye have heard of my conversation in the time past 
in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and I wasted it. He's pretty much said, I was pretty good at what I did. And profited in the Jews' religion above my equals, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions. He was a zealous, zealous man. Philippians chapter 3, turn over there real quick. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5, we'll read a couple verses. Again, Paul kind of gives his history. He says in verse 5 of Philippians 3, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless, but what the things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. That resume, Pharisee, Hebrew, keeper of the law, persecutor of the church, I did all of these things. That resume was worth nothing. The only thing that mattered was the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What I like about Paul is in either side, he was not a fence sitter, okay? He wasn't one foot in, one foot out, wasn't really sure where he wanted to be. Man, when he was a Pharisee, he was all in as a Pharisee. And when he became a Christian, he was all in as he became a Christian. Boy, this is what we need, isn't it? We need people that are going to be determined, no matter what side of the fence they're on, they're going to be all in. And I would encourage you, be all in in 2019. Get yourself a Bible and determine to get all in that thing. Because when you get in all of that, God's going to get all over you. That's his promises. That's what he delights to do is to work in our lives. Verse 15 it says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. I love this, uh, this phrase here, who separated me from my mother's womb. Jeremiah says something very similar in, in chapter 1. He says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. I love how God is so beautifully at work in, in the world around us. I love how God is working uh, on redeeming people that seem unredeemable, right? I mean, Paul, Paul is this, he is an angry, violent man. He is exterminating men and women that are of the way, that are disciples of Jesus Christ. This is a guy that we would look at and hope he gets hit by a truck, right? We would look and go, oh, it would be merciful for, for, for lightning to strike this guy down, or this would be great if, you know, if this guy just somehow vanquished. We wouldn't care. Nobody would even ask any questions. We'd just go, hallelujah. But what happens in the life of Paul? This guy that we look at and go, he's too rough and tough for the gospel, He'll never be a Christian. He's too hard. He's too involved in his own. He's too zealous. He's too Islamic. He's too Catholic. He's too religious. He'll never receive the gospel message is the guy that God confronts and completely melts all that away because he says in verse 15, he said he was separated from his mother's womb and called by his grace. God from the beginning had a plan for Paul's life. Now, I want you to be careful in here. In all of this, we, we must see that, that although there is an election that is taking place, here is a man that is maybe elected, but maybe not saved. You, you see what I'm saying? You could, well, he was called from his mother's womb. Listen, he was unsaved. You can, you can go hyper-Calvinist on me and say, well, if he's elected and he's saved, listen, if he died before that Damascus road, our boy was an unbeliever, and he would have gone to hell. You can say, well, he didn't go to hell because, he, okay, I get the argument, but if he was an unbeliever, so he, you can say, well, he was from his mother's womb. That's what it says by God's grace. God's grace was not poured out upon him until he had a meeting 
with the great revealer of truth, Jesus Christ. And that's when his heart was warmed to the gospel truth and he shed everything else and all those beliefs and he was completely willing to move forward. Often we look at the zeal of a person and we think there is no hope. We look at the sin of a person and think there is no hope. We look at the darkness of a person and think there is no hope. Listen, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. He brought forth the gospel for sinners, not saints. That's why he shed his blood, for those that are sinners. And just because a person has a little bit of sin or a lot of sin, the blood of Jesus Christ will wash all that away. I was reading a story this week of a guy named Tom Papania, I guess is how you'd say his name. He was, he was second in command in the New York City Mafia. At 10 years of age, he was, uh, he was, his dad was, uh, had come over from Sicily, and his dad was a bad dude. He was in charge of the mafia there, and his dad was beating him. At 10 years of age, he vowed that he would never cry again, okay? And so he began to grow up in this mafia system, and his heart became cold, um, and as a, a young man, he became a thief, eventually was an extortionist, and ended up... Uh, murdering many, many people. His heart was so cold, they said, when other criminals would look into his eyes that they would have a shiver go down their spine. He was just a bad, bad guy, okay? Eventually, God spoke into Tom's heart, and he rejected, he pushed away, and he said, I'm going to get in front of God. I don't want God to catch up to me. So he says, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end my own life so God can't do what he wants to do in my life. So he went to his whole hotel room and he got himself a gun and he was just about ready to kill himself and the phone rang. He said, fine, I'll answer the phone. He answered the phone and it was a friend that had invited him to church saying, hey, why don't you come to church tonight with me? And the guy said, fine, this way I can, I can show God that I can go to church and still do what I want to do. So he went to church and he went through the whole message and the, got done with the service and the pastor walked up to him, they introduced themselves and he looked in this man's eyes and he says, you look like a hurt boy deep inside. You look like you're, you're just a boy that's been hurt. And he said, that man, Tom said, that man made me so angry because he was able to see into my soul and realized how vulnerable I was. Everybody else thought I was this rugged, tough, mean, angry person. And this pastor looked at me and realized that I was broken. And so he went home and he, and he determined he was going to go back that night and kill that pastor. Get rid of him. And so he did. He went back that night and, and uh, he walked into that church, purposed to kill him. Instead, he sat down with that pastor and they began to talk. One hour, two hour, three hours. Finally, he began to cry and confess all the things that he had done. And he said to this pastor, let me tell you the things. And in, in essence, what he was doing is confessing all of his faults and, and recounting all the, all the criminal activity and all the sinful activity he had done. And, and finally, the pastor said, why don't you just call on Jesus and he will forgive you. And he said, God can't forgive me. And he said, yes, he can. And that man called out on Jesus' name and was completely changed. See, oftentimes we, we stop and we think, you know, he's in the mafia. That boy right there, I hope, I hope somebody takes him out. It would just be one less bad dude in this world, and then us righteous people would have a better time, right? Jesus says, I created these people for a purpose. Every one of them has my fingerprint, has my design, and I'm not giving up on them, and I don't think you should either. We look at this text, we realize that God does a work to transform people, the bad, the ugly, the fake, the pretenders, the wealthy, the weak. It transformed because God is truly the gospel. And isn't it beautiful, just about the time we think a person has no hope and just about the time we abandon a person and think that nothing can take place, that God steps in and does the impossible does the impossible. If you've ever, if you've ever uh, listened to the song Amazing Grace, it was written by um, John Newton, who was a captain of a slave ship. 
And he was a man that was tormented for years by what he, do, what he was doing he knew was wrong. He was taking uh, African slaves and he was bringing them to Europe and into the Caribbeans and he was selling them for merchandise. And of course, if you know anything about the slave trade, oftentimes the ships were not fit with enough food and water and they would just, you know, take the merchandise and throw it overboard in order that there would be enough space for all. Well, you know, as human beings, we recognize what we're doing, and so you have to become harder and harder. But eventually the gospel came into John Newton's life, and he went from being a murderer and a slave trader to becoming a minister of the gospel. I don't know. I would look at some of these people and think to myself, I don't think God can help this person. Has that ever crossed your mind? It has mine. I look at some people and go, that dude's hard. That dude is just you, can just, you can just tell he's cold and dark. But God doesn't give up on anybody. He didn't give up on me, and that's beautiful. Verse 16 of Galatians, he says, um, he said he, call, he was called by his grace. Then look at verse 16. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. And immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. I, I, I love this section of Scripture. It is God that has called him, okay, but we see that the purpose is not just eternal salvation and forgiveness, but it's a calling also to serve God, to do something. We are not saved. We aren't going to, we shouldn't receive the gospel simply for eternal life and forgiveness. When we receive the gospel, Paul says, it, it was by God's grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. And immediately, I conferred. Immediately, I understood. This is what I needed to do. I, I want all of us to realize this. Salvation is extremely personal. It is an intersection with God. It's not a church response. It's not everybody uh, uh, receive of the Lord's Supper. It's not everybody get baptized. It's, it's not everybody come into this building and you're obviously a Christian because you're in this building. Christianity is an intersection. It's a relationship with God. It's a confessing of my sins and calling out to Him because I need to be rescued from my sin, from the darkness of my soul. You go, well, I was never like that mafia guy. You're probably a lot more similar than you realize. Probably a whole lot more similar than you realize. The second aspect of this is we are all saved to serve. For Paul, it was that he might preach the, uh, 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 Jesus preach the gospel among the heathen. And I get, not everyone is called to be a missionary, although we are all called to be missionaries to some degree. We are all called to present the gospel, to evangelize. Ephesians chapter 4, he says, he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, he says, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So there's five different categories here that the body of Christ would be perfected. We, we don't all, we're not all these five things, but we all can be these different parts. We see in other areas of Scripture, the, there's mercy, there's exhortation, there's the gift of giving, there's administration, there's service. There's all sorts of things that the body of Christ should be doing. We have been saved to serve. And every one of us has been gifted, has been given an ability and I'm not talking about, hey, you know, I'm, uh, you know I'm, 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 I'm good at some things. No, I'm talking about a spiritual gift, a spiritual ability God has given to you. We did a spiritual gifting class uh, uh, last year. When was that? June-ish maybe, something like that. Last year we had two or 300 people that came in and took this test and helped go through this. And we've done that class a couple other times on Sunday mornings. That's still available. If you want to learn what your, maybe where your spiritual gifts are, sign up, take this class, and then you'll be able to learn how to kind of use the things that God has given you in the local church and how that benefits the body of Christ. There is a place for everyone to get involved. I was talking to our music guy, 
And he said, we need people to play this thing right here. We're running out of pianists, okay? We don't have enough people to play the piano. So he says, would you please make an announcement that we need? There's some people in this church that are gifted uh, pianists but are not using that for the Lord. Uh, we need a guitarist. We need some drummers. We need lightboard people, soundboard people. We need people to hold up the doors and people to, to say welcome when you come in. We need people in the Sunday schools. We need people in the nurseries. We could use another preacher, I bet, too, right? You're supposed to say, no, we got that one covered, right? <laughs> the point is, the point is every one of us has been gifted, and we need to use that gifting in order to benefit the church of God. And you say, well, that's kind of self-serving. Don't you remember what we talked about in Acts chapter 9? When Paul persecuted, when Saul persecuted the church, he was persecuting Jesus. To serve in the church is to serve Jesus. That's the reality of all of this. He says, neither I went up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles. He said, this, uh, this was not by man. This didn't take place. He says, it was, it was three years later. He says, I'm, I'm not lying to you. And then in verse 23, I, I like this. He says, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. People were nervous around Paul because he was such a zealous man that these people weren't sure if he was like a spy, that he was trying to infiltrate these Christian cells so that he could root them out like that. And so everybody was like, I don't know if I believe this. I'm not sure if this is really taking place. I'm not sure if, I, if I'm for this, right? It's going on. But the reality is he, he, his life had changed. Uh, a person should be changed by the gospel. A person should be changed by Jesus Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, why don't you turn there? This is one of those verses that you should know. So underline it in your Bible or... Highlight it, or however you do that. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if, 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 that's an if statement, if any man be in Christ, so if you're of the way, if you're a disciple, if you're a follower, if you have been born again, if you've received the gospel, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Listen, Christians should have a testimony. They should be a light and a salt to this world. You can't fabricate that. It should just happen because you're now filled with the Spirit of God, because the gospel, because Jesus has forgiven you. Now, I get we need to grow, we need to understand, we need to learn, we need to do some things, okay? But I can never fabricate or manufacture or rehearse my testimony. It is who I am, okay? So uh, when you become a Christian, people at work should look at you and go, man, what happened? What do you mean what happened? I feel the same. I looked, don't I look, my clothes are, what did I, you know, I got a sock on my back or what? You know, people should understand, they look at you, no, I, nothing really changed. Yes, something changed. For the first time in your life, you're actually alive. Yeah. Ephesians 2 said you were dead in your trespasses. Now you are alive. For the first time in my life, I am alive. I was alive physically. Now I'm alive spiritually as God designed me. I am now alive. The Spirit of God is pulsing through my body. People around us will know that. You may not even, uh, you may not even be saying to them, I'm a Christian, I'm passing out 100 tracks a day and, 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 and judging people, right? But it's okay to be judgmental, right? But there's a difference for the Christian. People should look at and say, what happened to you? I remember when... I remember you doing, I remember you going, I remember this. What happened to you? Well, let me tell you, I was on my road, and there was a thunder in my soul, and it changed my whole life. Now, that's what happened to Saul. If you want to hear my story, I was in the second floor of my parents' farmhouse next to a waterbed. It's not quite as cool as Paul's, but... 
That's my thunder story right there. And when I got up, I was a new creature. Old things were passed away and all things had become new. Matthew chapter 5 and uh, Galatians chapter 1 verse 24, it says, They glorified God, they glorified God in me. Matthew 5 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, that's what Christians are. They are, they are those that are to be glorifying God. They're, we are just reflecting the light of a glorious gospel. We're just opening up the love that God, that's all that Paul is doing right here. And they're going, man, we don't like who you are because your system is different than our system. Listen, all of us have a religious system and it makes us rigid and inflexible. And Jesus comes into our system and says, ah, that system's not working because it'll never get you to me. The only way to get to me is through the sun, is through the cross. And so we continue to study this beautiful epistle in which Paul, in, 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 in a marvelous way, has been confronted. And each one of us is able to have that same confrontation through the Scripture as we hear God's voice and as we're challenged and as we're pushed and we're pulled to be people of faith, people that resemble more and more the image of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you're uh, Tom the Mafia guy in New York City. It doesn't matter if you're a good little schoolgirl. The same blood that was shed for Tom, and the same blood that was shed for this little schoolgirl can cleanse every single one of us eternally and can even change our life right now abundantly. Let's pray.